So I'm going to start by talking about graduate school. And buried underneath Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles is a lab that few people know about. It's not advertised on websites or boasted of in brochures. And this is because it's the animal research lab at Children's Hospital. And it was in this lab that I spent countless hours during my PhD infecting a special breed of mouse with HIV. One morning, I was leaning over one of these animals when suddenly the mouse jerked and the needle I was holding in my hand plunged into my finger. I had just accidentally infected myself with HIV and I was terrified. But now when I look back on it, I wonder why was I so scared? What is it about HIV that is so frightening? The disease isn't like it was in the 1980s. It's no longer a death sentence. Today we have effective therapies that allow people living with HIV to live long, healthy lives. A colleague of mine once asked me, if I had to choose, which would I pick, diabetes or HIV? It's a silly question, but it's actually a fair comparison. Both diabetes and HIV are chronic diseases that are managed by medication. In fact, you could easily make the case that diabetes would be the worst one of the two to have. But for most of us, we wouldn't pick HIV. And the reason has n almost nothing to do with medicine, but everything to do with stigma. So I was lucky that day. I didn't get HIV from that needle stick. But what I did gain is a better understanding of how lies and stigma shape human disease. And what I've learned is that just as important as science, just as important as, as medicine is our perception of disease. Now, few diseases were as poorly regarded as cancer was in the 1950s. It was considered a disease of civilization, and people that had it couldn't even talk about it. The word cancer couldn't be said aloud on the radio. And the person who changed that was Mary Woodward Lasker. She was married to Albert Lasker, the famous advertising executive, and the two of them waged this PR campaign against cancer. One of the first things Mary did was persuade David Sarnoff, the head of the American Broadcasting Corporation, to not only allow the word cancer to be said on air, but to run a series of ads aimed at promoting awareness of the disease and bringing in wealthy donors. The next thing she did is reorganize the American Cancer Society, and she cleaned house. She got rid of the physicians and scientists that were running this very small organization and replaced them with ad executives and producers. And you can imagine that this led to some big changes. Now there were campaigns that used celebrities and posters to show that anyone could get cancer. And so this was all about lessening the stigma of the disease. Now she wasn't just content with these efforts. She was also intrigued by this new experimental therapy that was very controversial. It was a drug development program called chemotherapy. And scientists in the 1950s weren't excited about it. There was very little data that it would be effective in humans. And so because of this, there was little reason to put a lot of energy and research into it. But Mary felt differently. And so what she did is she brought expert speakers to testify before Congress. She started this letter writing campaign and she made significant fundraising for political contributions. And this had an enormous effect. And because of her, in 1955, $3 million was allocated to start this chemotherapy research program. Scientists were incensed by this. In one committee, they said, the availability of money exceeded the availability of sound ideas. 
And part of that anger was the fact that you had this wealthy socialite who knew nothing about medicine, but who was coming in and redefining health research in the US. And unfortunately, this bitterness persisted with chemotherapy, even when it started to become successful. So the first reports of chemotherapy being effective in humans came in 1958 by Dr. Min Chu Lee, and he was able to cure several of his female patients using chemotherapy, and he was rewarded for this by being fired. That's how poorly they thought of chemotherapy. Now, he did fine. He ended up getting another job and ended up making very important contributions in chemotherapy. And today, of course, chemotherapy is a cornerstone of our cancer treatment. Before Mary Lasker became involved, only 35% of people with a cancer diagnosis survived for five years or longer. And today, that number is 68%. So while cancer is becoming less deadly, tuberculosis is raging on. Over the two centuries that we have dealt with tuberculosis as humans, it has killed a billion people. It's estimated that one third of the world's population is infected with a latent form of the disease. And it was once known as consumption, and this is because the disease literally consumes you. It eats away at the fat at your body, and it gives you this pale, sickly appearance. And actually, in the 1800s, this pale, sickly skin was seen as romantic, and young women would pale their skin to mimic the effects of tuberculosis. They may have been inspired by Shakespeare, who wrote of females with consumption that they were, quote, pale primroses that die unmarried. However, in 1882, when it was discovered that a bacteria was actually the cause of tuberculosis, and it wasn't this romantic disease of enlightenment, people quickly changed their minds. And in 1912, a group of scientists that were part of the National Association for the Prevention of Tuberculosis, today the American Lung Association wrote, quote, Tubercle is in truth a coarse, common disease, bred in foul breath, in dirt, in squalor. The beautiful and rich receive it from the unbeautiful poor. Tubercle attacks failures. And you can imagine this kind of vitriol is coming from physicians, people that are supposed to be helping those with tuberculosis. But that's how bad the stigma was for the disease. And part of the problem was is that there simply was no treatment for tuberculosis. So the only thing they could offer was fresh air, sunshine, sleep. And to this end, they carted people off to sanitariums. Now, one of these sanitariums in Delaware was in danger of closing its doors in the early 1900s. And this is when a social worker named Emily Bissell got involved. And she was inspired by this Danish postal clerk to begin selling Christmas seals in her local post office for a penny apiece. She, her goal was to raise $300, which would be enough to save the sanitarium. But by the end of that first year, she actually raised 3,000. And this huge amount of money got a lot of attention. Now newspapers were interested, and scientists were contacting her, and this burgeoning American Lung Association was very interested in how they could make this into a national campaign. But of course, there were critics as well. There were people that called this, quote, fundraising at a penny pace. And the thought was that unless you had wealthy philanthropists, you couldn't possibly raise enough money from just regular people donating their pennies. However, the campaign did go national, and that first year they raised a quarter of a million dollars. This was a windfall, not just for research and not just for sanitariums, but for the American Lung Association to now begin a PR campaign. And they used posters to show once again that TB could affect anyone. It was no longer had to be the source of stigma. And this really got into getting early prevention for people, but it also drew in researchers who had been afraid to be associated with the disease. Now they weren't so scared to work on it. And because of this, in 1944, a graduate student at Rutgers 
uh, discovered the first antibiotic effective against TB, streptomycin, and today we have combination therapy that is able to cure most TB in six months. So just like cancer, just like TB, HIV has had a few public relations difficulties. There was a time when it was known as gay cancer in the 1980s, and this is a dark time in HIV history. During this time, there were physicians who would not treat their patients with the virus. There were many scientists who refused to work on it. They didn't want to be associated with it. And by the mid-1980s, there was desperation. They were so desperate for any drug that could help. And so you can imagine how frustrating it must have been to learn that in fact there was a drug effective against HIV. It just wasn't yet approved by the FDA. And this is AZT, the first drug for HIV. So in response, activist groups staged these wide-scale protests and they started a vicious PR campaign that was basically accusing the FDA of murder. It was very effective. They changed not only AZT's approval, they speeded it up so that that drug was now available in 1987, but they completely changed the way our clinical trial system works. Today, we have access to investigational new drugs and patients can access enrolling clinical trials in a way that we could not even contemplate 30 years before. So although we have these effective therapies for HIV, we're still searching for a cure. And there's a group of promising clinical trials aiming to cure HIV that has an unusual origin story. It starts in 2008 with a journalist named Mark Schuffs. He was attending this HIV meeting in Boston and he went into the conference hall and in a corner of the conference hall, he sees this poster that's just neglected. No one is paying it any attention. It was a poster by a German hematologist named Giro Hüter. And despite the fact that he had only ever treated one HIV patient, he'd been able to do something that no one had ever done before. He'd given this patient a bone marrow transplant from a person who is naturally resistant to HIV. So there's a small group of people that are naturally able to control th their HIV and they can't become infected. Um, and so by giving these cells, which contain just a single mutation, he was able to cure his patient, who is an American named Timothy Ray Brown, of both his cancer and his HIV. This was astounding. And so of course, no one believed it. But Mark Schuess was able to see something that this room full of scientists and experts couldn't see. And so he published an article about the research in the Wall Street Journal, and that article was transformative. Giro Hüter had previously submitted his research to the prestigious journal Nature. That paper was rejected. Now, it was accepted. He was invited to these think tanks, and perhaps most importantly, these, this fledgling gene therapy field was given some importance and it was finally given some funding. And today we're seeing the fruits of this. We are now seeing some promising early results from some of these clinical trials using gene therapy approaches to HIV. So cancer, TB, HIV, they're all connected by this cycle of lies and stigma, often perpetuated by our medical professionals. Um, and then something unexpected happens. Someone emerges who is not necessarily a clinician, but is able to fundamentally change the way a disease is perceived. Today, we are just surrounded by disease campaigns. And at the same time, we're surrounded by critics. We are constantly hearing that these movements are trendy, that they are ineffective, that they, they are futile. Um, so it's important to remember that when you take part in them, when you do a relay race, when you do an ice bucket challenge, even the humble like and tweet have this critical role in changing disease.
you're joining this legacy, this movement that is all about changing how a disease is perceived in a way that is just as critical as anything coming out of a lab or a clinic. We can't possibly change medicine until we change opinions. Thank you. <laughs>